Hello, and welcome to the Queer Monkey Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the executive director and president of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the director of research, education, and outreach. And on behalf of our board of directors, our advisors and supporting members, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Queer Monkey Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness in the human story based on the work of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. As an educational institution, we recognize the thrive. We, we must take a, an open approach. And so we invite scholars of parallel research and related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this conversation for exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, we're having a full spectrum of topics from neuroscience, mysticism, trance states, anthropology, art history, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, shamanism, mythology, and much, much more. Visit our website at queamungainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a supporting member. And of course, we thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Queamungay Institute. <clears throat> Let's get to today. Ever since the dawn of humanity, the skies have influenced every part of our lives, from navigation, to planting crops, for aligning our buildings and sacred sites, and to define the very idea of time itself. Our ancestors lived amidst nature in a much more connected way than most of us do today. They observed the universe marveling in its rhythms. They used the sun and the moon as a sort of calendar tracking the sun's path across the skies. And we can see this reflected in ancient sites such as Stonehenge in England, Machu Picchu in Peru, Chichen Itza, Mexico, Newgrange in Ireland, the Sphinx, the pyramids. The pathways of the gardens of the Taj Mahal in India are perfectly aligned with the sun and the summer solstice. And how about Africa, the 7,000 year old not to play a stone circle. It's said to be the oldest known astronomical site on earth and closest to home here at the Institute, Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. Wherever our ancestors set foot, they built sites to observe and measure cosmic events and perform rituals to celebrate this critical linkage between the celestial forces and the human experience. One of these most important parts of these events was what we want to focus on today. Is the solstice asking us, how do these alignments, how do we see these alignments in the sacred sites be so accurate? What is the technology that can, can explain these alignments in, in this technology? Well, it goes actually on a much larger sphere than that. I think this relationship that we've always had by we, I mean, all of humanity back through time, this relationship we've always had with the sky, we have talked with so many guests uh, here in this forum on that. Uh, recently, the cosmologists Nancy Abram and Joel Primack saying how precious, how rare it is, how the whole evolutionary drift journey from the Big Bang forward has come together for this. We are in this womb, this fertile womb of the cosmos, where we exist because the cosmos arranged it so. Brian Swim says that with Monica DeRast and Brian Tucker of the Deemed Time Network and Bill Halal of the Global Consciousness Network. It's now a committee of the uh, within the Queen Munga Institute. Right, right. Frederick Smith, Vedic scholar, Chris and Todd Van Poole, anthropologists look at the cosmology shaping the art of Mesoamerica and the Southwest early on. Tony Hull, our guest, along with Bob Woodruff, uh, working on the Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope, designing it, Diana Dragomir, astrobiologist. We have the modern perspective. Let's go out and see what secrets the cosmos hold and let's send these instruments out there to bring in this data to inform us. We've had Abby Loeb of Harvard, Edwin Turner of Princeton, many, many weighing in. And also, though, as much as we're out there looking at the ancient perspective, and uh, adding to our modern perspective, we've got light pollution. We've got this shield of hardware now around our planet obscuring our view. We need to reclaim that relationship that we once had, that our ancestors had. The glittering fabric of the cosmos 
is so gorgeous and yet it's obscured more and more every year from our view. Why does this matter? Why? Because we are larger than we know. We are rarer than we know. We are more precious than we know. And by we, I mean this web of life, the biosphere, our planet. We are part and parcel with all there is in the cosmos. And if we can think of ourselves as one family navigating this universe on spaceship Earth, on a spiral galaxy, on this disk, uh, journeying through space, then maybe we'll come together and start to protect it. Maybe we'll honor it for what it is. Mm. Maybe we'll honor each other for who we truly are and all of life. So I think to establish this personal relationship, uh, not just a personal, but a practical one, as you mentioned, it used to be the clock, the cosmic clock. Wherever you were, you could look up in the sky and the gears of our solar system would provide you a calendar. It was so useful. Now we have technology, but our solar system served as that cosmic clock, told us when to do what. And this personal relationship, I think Tony Hall, has done so much to give us tools, simple, simple tools to reestablish that. He calls for building a megalithic marker in your own backyard or even a wall of your home where the sun shines. And I think this is so important and it's such a fun exercise and it has certainly added to the Kuimungi Institute's uh, playground and it has certainly added to our own backyard where you, with Tony's instructions, built a beautiful circle. A marker. This is something that we can all do. And it's a beautiful way to establish and honor our relationship with the cosmos and to help reclaim that. Welcome, Tony. Um, you have new footage to show us. You've, you've touched on this with the equinoxes and the solstice uh, over the last couple of years, but you've got new footage, new, new charts, new inspiration, and uh, welcome back. Well, thank you very much. And, and there's huge resonance with everything that Paul and Laura have just said. Uh, Kindred spirits for sure, and uh, and I very much appreciate this whole format. Uh, it is rare to have a situation, uh, a, a stage where where science and intuitive knowledge can be presented on equal footing. Generally, there's oh that that's all wrong and this is all right, or we can only be on evidence based. I I walk I have a foot in both worlds, and. Uh, as some of you may remember, I presented recently on the James Webb Space Telescope, which uh, I had a, a role, I led the team that polished all its mirrors. And last week I was at the American Astronomical Society meeting uh, presenting, presenting concepts of what the next great observatory that will launch in about 25 years will look like. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and somewhat controversially, I'll say too, but that's, that's okay. That's that, that, that's that's my world. I can do that. Uh, well, let me just say um, that the the sky the sky has a, a really visceral meaning. And Laura is right. Light pollution and now the presence of vast constellations of satellites. Uh, there seems to be a growing consciousness of what this means. Uh, lower satellites. In 10 years, we may see more of those than we see stars in the sky. And there's almost no international reg regulation on that. However, there are committees being formulated on both the professional and the um, visceral level, again, to, uh, to address this. Light pollution, uh, it, it amazes me how unconscious people are shooting up lights around. But there is the International Dark Sky Association in Tucson. I'm a member. I hope you all consider being a member. It's, it's a worthy cause. Mm. Well, what, what are we looking at now? Um, the night sky is precious. I love that. But we're talking more about the, the, the day sky, which is also precious. And, uh, and uh, consider what it would be like for people before the age of television, before the age of books and electricity, uh, just consider that that as one looked around, and if you go to a place like Chaco Canyon, you feel this, or even uh, pretty much anywhere in New Mexico, you look around and you have the sky and you have the earth, and you begin to ponder what is the connection, and then there's the great power of the sun that influences everything that we do. And that's a, a really, um, really vital, vital thing. So is it reasonable to think 
that one would begin to notice a relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. And at some point, maybe I can go into my slides. Is this a good time? Yeah, uh, Tony, I'm ask you just, can I have you slide to your right a little bit so the light behind you is not glaring so much? So okay. kind of move your laptop that direction. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Than having little... Perfect. Yes, okay. That's better, much better. Thank you. Uh, much better, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I was I was hoping there'd be a view of outside, but of course that didn't work out. <laughs> so, well, uh, let me let me go to the slideshow if I may. Here it comes. Okay. Well, uh, as we saw earlier, um, uh, Paul designed a beautiful uh, introduction to this. Uh, maybe much of the story is uh, is in in these uh, two pictures that are here. But let me go ahead. Um, the abstract said that that um, that we're celebrating the solstice and and in fact it is a, a a strong event and we're also going to talk about a tool that lets us connect the celestial sphere to the terrestrial and this tool we'll see can do some things that that have not been well recognized before uh, one is to define the cardinal directions east west is a very hard or north south for that matter, are very hard to do. Um, even with a compass, it's very hard to do because you have a difference between magnetic north and true north. Um, the North Star um, a thousand years ago was not north, it was six degrees off north. This is due to precession of the equinox. So, so things are changing, but nevertheless, we have buildings, structures, all around the world in pretty much every continent except perhaps Antarctica, which uh, illustrate alignment uh, alignment to these cardinal directions. Not all buildings, but many. And it would be very logical if you had a sacred building or a public architecture, I think, to reference this. And the question is, how do we do this? And, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about, about where, where I think that may have come from. So um, we have the joy of sunrise, and uh, I love watching sunrise and sunset. Uh, uh, this is, of course, at the the labyrinth, which Paul showed earlier, and and there are some characters we know in this picture. We won't go into more detail now uh, here. So what are we doing? Um, we we can look at the at the uh, sunrise. Let's look east, and this figure shows a person looking east. And, and along the horizon, the, the position of where the sun will rise at the equinox uh, is not the same as that at either the winter or summer solstice. This is not my figure. Uh, to be more now politically correct, the winter solstice is the December solstice because we have people in the southern hemisphere, and our winter is their summer, and vice versa. This is the June solstice that we're approaching. Okay, so uh, what do I see from my house? I, if I step out on the east deck in the morning, about six fifteen of right now, and I do this, um, I do this every morning. Uh, we see, uh, I see the sun rising, very much like in the position where you see now. And I'm going to go, go through some slides fairly quickly that will show. Uh, how this phenomena uh, changed coming into this date. So here's June 10th. It's a little bit off mode. The second, the June 2nd, you can see it's off that line. As as I go to uh, to May, uh, we're way off that line. Third uh, of May, farther off. The 8th of April, we've moved quite a bit to the south. The 20th of March on or about the the equinox, and we can see where the sun um, the sun was rising then. And uh, 13th of March, still farther over. 26th of February, 4th of February, 24th of January, and um, around the uh, the time of the December solstice of the uh, well. Uh, not the December solstice, so 20th of January. You can see how it's trending, and it, it's going farther and further to the right. Well, also uh, when I look out um, to the west, and this is a, a picture I took a few days ago, 
showing sunset, you can see a little blob, if you can see my pointer, that's Cabazon, a volcano about 45 miles away. And you can see the rays of the sun modulated by the clouds. And, and it's always a beautiful thing. I love watching sunset. And as I look from my, uh, as I look from my deck, uh, I, I can see sunset at different times of the year. Uh, at the uh, June solstice, it's a little bit to the right of or north of this volcano. And here's what it looks like through my telescope. And a few days ago, I took a picture, well, the June 8th, I took a picture with the sun setting right behind Cabazon, uh, that this volcano feature. And if I go back to 13th of April, 26th of February, etc. So you can see the, the motion is most definite. Well, why, why does this happen? And this is sort of a, an Astronomy 2 diagram. I, I promise you not to go into too much detail about this. But the Earth, um, the Earth is inclined, its rotation axis is inclined to the, the, the revolution axis around the Sun in its orbit. So in June, um, in June, we're looking down and the Sun is more in the Northern Hemisphere. In December, uh, we have the opposite happening. The sun, the sun will rise and set more in, in the Southern Hemisphere. And this means we have total different arcs across the sky and the equinox is equal in March or September. And so right now we have a situation, uh, uh, and again, I apologize, I have summer here, June solstice, uh, uh, a diagram that looks, um, looks like this, where we have the altitude of the sun above the horizon, and you can see the sun is rising um, to the uh, north of east, just as suspected, and that's going to manifest in, in what we're going to talk about soon. Now, most horizons are not flat unless you're on the ocean, uh, and so you probably have a situation like, like this, where there's a little bit of offset between the, the uh, coordinates you might calculate for sunrise and sunset and when it actually happens. And, and this is taken into account, um, including my horizons, both my, my eastern and western horizons uh, show uh, horizon features. And where you live, it may well do that. Well, the uh, sunrise shadows, I'm sorry, I missed a word here, can be long. And this is something which uh, which uh, we take advantage of. And, and there is a device called a gnomon. What is a gnomon? A gnomon can be a stick in the wall, a stick in the, the ground. It can be a hole in a, in a cave. It can be any of a number of things. But, but it, it has no requirement on how straight it is or whether it's vertical or not. It does, however, have a requirement that the ground be level. And you heard Paul mention that at Kayamunge, uh, level ground is not, um, not common. So uh, what do you see here? The sun, um, depending on what its elevation is, and you saw elevation in a previous figure, will project a, sh a shadow of the, of the pole, the gnomon, and it will go out some distance. And that distance will be, uh, that length will be determined by the height of the sun. And the height of the sun changes um, uh, throughout the day from being at zero degrees, near zero degrees at sunrise to being near zero degrees at sunset, and now being quite high in the sky, I think, what, um, 70 odd degrees uh, now in, in the summer. So we have um, uh, a difference depending on when, on when, this, uh, when we're looking at it. Well, uh, again, going back to uh, why do we care about solstices and, and equinoxes? Um, I used to think that the equinox was meaningless. And, and I was making a presentation at a conference in, at, here in New Mexico at the Maxwell Museum, which I actually chaired, called Astronomy and Ceremony in the Prehistoric Southwest. And so I thought, well, I should figure out that this gnomon thing, what, what, what does this mean? And I started making some calculations and then I began to see, to see uh, something that will uh, be revealed in the next couple of slides. 
So Paul um, was kind enough to implement a gnomon on the Kayamange grounds. It is just off, just a little bit to the south of the of the labyrinth. And, um, and you can see in the upper right, the maypole, that's a different thing. Uh, but it, it cast a shadow as well. You can't quite make it out, but right in this area of the Noman ground, which Paul very uh, diligently flattened, uh, is, is the, the Noman pole. Okay, so, so the Noman at Kamge Institute, it's something that creates a shadow. And you can see the, uh, the shadow going um, among the rocks. And I believe this photograph might have been taken a little bit off, off the, uh, the uh, June solstice, but you can see the shape uh, basically of the shadow as it changes during the day. Uh, now, now the form will change from winter to summer and the form will change, well, that's happening now uh, is the, this arc. However, if you look over to the left, you see a straight line. And on the equinox, and only on the equinox, does the tip of the shadow, if you place a rock every 20 minutes or so, uh, turn out to be a straight line. And that straight line is exactly east and west, provided the land is flat. That's a, that's a requirement. So, um, so the... I think it's very interesting to look at the shadow of a gnomon on the uh, December solstice and our present June solstice. Uh, it does represent the motion of, of the sun through the sky, uh, but it is not um, necessarily quite as defining of the date. Uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, there's very little difference, plus or minus, uh, you know, visually, plus or minus a week to 10 days. So if you wanted to go and see where the sun was going to rise uh, on Tuesday, the 21st, and it was cloudy, you could take a picture four or five days later, and it would look exactly the same. So, uh, so if you are recording this, it's relatively insensitive. Uh, the importance of the solstice, both, both the uh, solstices, or that, that they are what I call a singularity, which means uh, the sun is progressing in one direction or the other. In the case of the, the summer, it's going farther and farther north, bringing more light and more energy and heat to the earth. But, it's, but it starts going there more and more slowly, and eventually it stops and it reverses. The other solstice uh, that happens in December the same thing happens. The sun is going farther and farther south. It's getting colder and colder. The sun's making a low arc in the sky. Uh, in the case of the, the uh, Shumash people, the, the medicine people among the Shumash, which were located in the Santa Barbara region of California, as recorded by Harrington, the, the recorder of, an early recorder and anthropologist in the uh, 19th century, uh, the Antop uh, proclaimed that they had to do ceremony and, and songs as the, as the sun approached the, uh, the December solstice. And they had to bring the sun back again because it was going in the wrong direction and they would have forever darkness if, if they let it go too far. And they did this um, annually, of course, and, and they were very successful at it, as, as one would predict. But so the, the solstice, uh, the date of the solstice is hard to know, but that a solstice is happening, you're, that, that there's a singularity, the sun is stopping and turning around, and that this can be marked in rock art or in building structures is, is fairly obvious. Less so for the equinox, because it's extremely hard, other than the, by the gnomon method, to know the date of the equinox. Um, unless you happen to be looking over the ocean or something very, very flat. Uh, and you, your, your date estimate of the equinox could be off by 10, 20, 30 days, even depending on what your landscape is like, your horizon is like. But by this method of the gnomon, you can see that there is a straight line. 
if we were to put stones down a couple of days earlier or later, there would be a slight curvature, which could be observed and measured. Well, one of the things that, that I, I find very interesting, and, and uh, I'm depending on, uh, on Google Maps for this, and at some point I would certainly like to go and visit, but let's take a look at, the, at, at a couple of buildings around the world. Uh, this is the Taj Mahal, uh, which uh, Fred May comment on. Uh, I was told by a taxi driver in Washington that, that it is melding and I better go see it soon, but I hope that's not the case. But it's aligned reasonably close to east-west, the, uh, the, uh, the fences around that. And, and it's also inclined about eight degrees to the river that it's at the bank, the uh, Yumuno River. I don't know how to pronounce it, Fred Wood. Uh, so, it, so one would think, you know, initially, if you were an architect, would you not align your, your, your beautiful building to the river? But instead, it's aligned fairly closely uh, to east-west. Now, a two-degree offset, which is what I measured off Google Maps, uh, would, would be perhaps a, a, a reasonable error if the land is not absolutely flat. And, uh, and when I do get to the Taj Mahal, I do want to make estimates of, of the, the degree that the land is not flat in front there. But this alignment could well be attributed to, uh, to placing a gnomon and, and doing your constructions with respect to the east-west which would make a reference to the a reference to the celestial sphere, and Fred, if you have any information on this, I'd welcome your comments. Well, I uh, there was a a kind of uh, astronomy that was used. Uh, much of it was in, in India at that time, about the time of the uh, Taj Mahal, maybe even earlier than that, uh, by a couple of centuries. That was a lot of it was actually imported from um, from Greek and uh, Middle Eastern astronomical uh, knowledge, um, and uh, so yeah, they they had it. They they I don't know what their techniques were, but they certainly I mean it was based on on Arabic um, astronomy at least the, the the cardinality the directionality that they measured at that time. I'm sure there were earlier techniques than that, and. Um, but at least as far as the Taj, uh, Taj Mahal goes, um, and um, yeah, because it's not lined up exactly as you say with the Yamuna River, but it's a few degrees, as you say, eight degrees tilt from it. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it important in the Vedic tradition to align or at least open buildings, their main entry should face east, is that true? Yes, that's very true. And in fact, I've, I've written about this at, even in my PhD dissertation, low of those many decades ago. And, um, but they did have, have techniques of measurement. Um, but I, you know, I don't know how they, I mean, they had techniques of measurement of the, of the actual structures themselves, the ritual structures. But I don't recall, I'd have to look, that there was a specific way that they lined it up with, with the precise, you know, cardinality. Why yeah. east? What was important about east? The and east was the direction of the of the rising sun. The east was the primary direction, much as north is the primary direction. For us, our, our maps are all, we have the magnetic north, a bit different from the true north, but north is the primary direction that we observe um, when we think about directions. But there, and, yeah, go on. No, you go ahead. But um, in, in ancient classical India, east was the primary direction. In fact, um, uh, the north was considered to be an inauspicious direction. And even in other cultures, we had it very different. We had in, in ancient China, for example, where north was the, was the most auspicious direction uh, because of the, of the pole star. Um, so uh, north Fred, Fred, Fred north though, I, I'm wondering about that because the pole star, as I mentioned a thousand years ago, due to precession, was about six degrees off the pole. It's now quite close, but this is a 20th century phenomenon, not, not, not an earlier one. However, there was the circumpolar motion, if you were to look at, at the arcs that a star would make in the sky, 
they would go around the North Pole. So one could infer that from making multiple observations that there was a center. Yeah, I don't know what the classical Chinese um, astronomical uh, practices were, but it's been written about really, really thoroughly. There's this God knows 20 volume series edited by a guy named Joseph Needham, N-E-E-D-H-A-M, on science and civilization in China, which he started publishing in the God knows 60, 70 years ago, and finished up, I think before he died about 20 years ago or so, but he worked on this forever. So there's a, so the, everything is out there in, in Needham's like 20 volumes. Um, so I'm sure, he, and he does have a volume on astronomical uh, calculations. Um, yeah. The magnetic, the, the magnetic compass would show you a different east-west than the celestial mapping, such as you're doing with the gnomon, right, Tony? Uh, yes, uh, it is. And even if you mark the magnetic declination, the north magnetic pole and the south magnetic pole, they move, they migrate. And so uh, in, in Chaco Canyon, the, the, the topological maps are, have a, a magnetic declination. Oh, I, I think it was done about, about 1930, 1940, something like that. But my measurements made uh, 60 years later, uh, I had to go and derive a whole different number and I could prove that it's, that, 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 that it's off by several degrees now. It moves remarkably fast. And if Chris Von Pohl was on and she could tell you there's an archaeological method of dating where you literally take soil that would tend uh, silt that would align to magnetic field. You take it out of the ground very carefully, clocking it very carefully. To help if, date. You look at, if you look at the orientation, it will tell you the date of that layer of slit of silt. Yeah. Um, so this is obviously not done with a, with mag with a magnetic compass. Those weren't even invented until much later. So well, these are celestial alignments for many of the ancient buildings around the world. Yeah, a magnetic compass would be of very little use. And magnetic declinations are fairly large. And I think in Chaco, it's 13 degrees, the nominal yeah. one, for example. And it's it's not a trivial number. It's uh, It would be a gross offset that, that would be easily uh, easily noticed. So the, so, the, the key insight here is that through a simple stick in the ground, a pole in the ground, and observation of the heavens through time, you can start tracking the equinox. It's going to lay out a straight line along the east-west celestial cardinal points. And from there, you, you have a compass, a true compass that will stay consistent over the eons. Uh, th th this is true. So, uh, and, and, I, and I think this is remarkable and also that it is a straight line and only on the equinox is it a straight line. Now, uh, if my friend, my astronomer friend, Kim Melville was on, he would argue, Tony, it's not a straight line. And, um, and, and in a sense, I will agree with him, uh, it, it's, because nature works in curves, right? Well, well, no. Let, let me say, uh, we we have when we use a topo map, we 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 basically have a, an approximation to a a curved Earth. We have we imagine the Earth is made up of a number of, of flat plates that may be a number of you know fifty or hundred miles across, and we measure easting and westing as the two coordinates on that. And this is how, how surveying is done and an archaeology survey is done in, in terms of easting and westing. Uh, it's, so it's an approximation. Uh, but I will say that, that the Noman shadow would be a straight line uh, to as well as you could perceive it using shadow and, and pebbles uh, to a minute amount even over, over a kilometer or more. So, so it, it is straight line. And the other thing is um, that a Noman shadow, a Noman shadow is not, um, is not necessarily sharp everywhere. When you're, when you have a, a shadow, uh, more or less the length of uh, the height of your, your Noman, and, and depending on what your width, the width of your Noman is, you have a, a projection and you get what's called an umbra and a penumbra effect. And if you go too far, the it becomes very fuzzy what you're trying to align your rocks to. 
So there's a limit to how high it's practical to make a gnomon, and that's probably something like like uh, you know four or five meters, and much beyond that, um, it becomes uh, you, you, your errors do not increase, your errors right. do not improve, I should say. So you designed about a six foot gnomon for the institute. Well, well, about yeah, it's 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 Prox. it's compatible with the the patch of land that Paul could could, could <laughs> put could together, make land. level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and and and, and it's, it's really marvelous how Paul goes and dives in these things. I got to say that again. <laughs> but let me let me move on yeah, here. Yeah, uh, yes, please, please. Yeah. Okay, okay, and this this shows sort of the gardens and 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 again again the the alignments there. Um, and and the, the the tilt of the river, but you can see there is a whole another cardinality established than that associated with the river, and things are quite rectilinear in it. Okay, another thing. Let's look at the pyramids. And uh, and here again we're having um, uh, we're having east west alignments that that are occurring, and and so. Uh, the Great Pyramid uh, and the and other pyramids in the in the cluster. Again, I've not been there, so I'm relying on on Google, and it's a little bit hard to see some of what's happening. You can see the the sides of, of the uh, the triangular sides of, of the pyramids, and you can see that the east west alignment is really quite good, about as good as I, I could measure it in in Google. Wow. So again, um, the Noman would do that. It's the simplest way to do this. Um, one can come up with all sorts of constructions. I've seen some insane constructions that people have made. Uh, I tend to like to uh, go to the, the, the simplest and, and most obvious solution that does not require uh, knowledge of, of mathematics, does not involve having to be able to do constructions, etc. Just observation or visitations from extraterrestrials. Yes, we can throw that out too. <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, who, who knows? I mean, yeah. I, I uh, I, I, I'm, I'm simply saying that often there is an explanation where where people claim there is not, and 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 the nomon is under recognized uh, for this. Uh, yes, there there are ways you can go and use a nomon. There's the Boy Scout compass method where you put a stick in the ground and. And and you uh, you you take several points and then you do you bisect the point by drawing circles and that way you can determine north. And actually, uh, I had a discussion in preparing a a a, a short scientific paper on this with uh, with one of the most prominent um, an astronomer and archaeo astronomer. I'll not mention his name, but but uh, he um, it said oh. But how do you how do you know how do you know the date of the equinox to be able to do this? And, and, it's quite the reverse. And, and, and this is somebody who, who's who's done cultural astronomy and published many books all from all over the world. And and then he said, Oh, oh, I see. Uh, you know the date of the equinox from the straight line. And I think that's uh, and then the straight line also gives you the cardinal directions. I, I think this is a. a a fresh and realistic way to look at alignments, whether it's in Mesoamerica or uh, or in in Egypt or even even some of the great buildings in in Europe, uh, India. Uh, I I'm not saying that I know this because I've not done my homework in terms of the of looking up the the cultural thing and, and reading uh, Fred's uh, twenty volume. Uh, uh, text that he mentioned about China, etc. At one point in my life, I hope to catch up with that. And I certainly welcome uh, the insights and knowledge that any of you have on this. Uh, so this is all uh, uh, phenomenological. It's something that interests me. And so I, I, I pursue it at this level. Perfect. Okay, so now let's go and talk about another place. It's called Pueblo Benito. And, uh, and um, you can see a picture of it on the left and a bird's eye view from the airplane above. And if you can see my pointer, uh, it's a D-shaped building. Mm -hmm. Pueblo Benito is remarkable. Until the year 1884, this was the largest structure in America. <laughs> and in 1884, a larger building was built in New York City. 
just to give you an idea of the monumental scale of this that goes back, a building that goes back uh, almost uh, 900 years. And the D shape is really interesting. There's been much discussion about the solar architecture associated with it and, and, and other benefits. Uh, there are two sections to the D shape. The westmost section seems to be exactly east-west. There's a, a small deviation of a, of a couple degrees on the east section of that. And this might be due to a tilt in the ground. Uh, I need to verify that. And I need to, to bring out tools for measuring tilt. That's a little bit more complicated than I, I've been able to do. But I'm going to talk about an experiment I've done on the equinox where the sun makes this arc in the sky. And again, here's, here's a, a picture of, of Benito. And you can see the white region here, the white bracket. Here, okay. And that's the region where I uh, set up an experiment a couple of years ago. And if my gnomon was very crude, it, it was a light stand, it's about 13 feet high. And you can see me placing stones uh, next to the, that section of the wall. And what I found was that, that I could measure the distance of each of the stones, the perpendicular distance from the wall to the stone. And so I had a series of, of data points and I did what's called a least squares analysis. And I found out that this locus produced there uh, agrees with the alignment of the building to about a tenth of a degree, plus or minus about a tenth of a degree. So I would say this, that an observant summit watcher, if, he picked, if the person picked this time of year uh, and placed some pebbles, could, could have created, um, uh, with only a pole in the, the, in the air, at one point that there, there may have been a tree there, who knows, or a tree trunk. Uh, they could have established the directionality of this building. How else would they have done it? Well, again, the ethnography does not inform us, at least that that I've seen, but I think it's uh, really interesting. It does require that the land be flat. And I picked this particular zone of the building because the land was, was very flat. Okay, uh, let's see here if I can... I have a little movie to show you that I did. Uh, this is in a different area and you can see the stones being placed. And this is taken all day. It's uh, done by the, the head of, of the Clark Planetarium in Salt Lake City, who is a, an expert photographer among other things. And you can see little, little bumps in the path. It's not purely 100% straight. Uh, but what, what is happening? Well, the land is not quite so flat there, and you're seeing this reflected in the height. And I have notes about where the height deviates. But you can see how this develops as the sun sweeps across. Uh, this is the shadow you watched. And every 20 minutes, um, I would dash in and dash out of the picture and, and do for count. Five, four, three, two, one, meaning that's how many seconds I had to get out of the picture. I, I think I got out of them all. but. Uh, so uh, actually, I'm seeing there's there's some notes in chat. If there are questions, perhaps before I move on farther, we should uh, talk about it. Um, Brian, do you want to monitor the chat and uh, uh, cite some particularly interesting questions? Oh, Monica. Uh, Monica yeah. uh, shared a short video from the story of the Noosphere, which speaks directly to the topic. Because you put a link in the chat room for people, a YouTube link. But uh, Monica, do you want to comment on that? I would just say that it's for viewing later, but it's uh, it, it, you, it, it's interesting because uh, we also have a video about this, the James Webb Space Telescope that that Tony presented on, and now there's this one that that talks about Stonehenge and what happened there, and and uh, each of them relates to uh, humanity's deepening reflective relationship in the world that it's in. Is it's taking you know as it develops through theoretic mind and you know from Neil you know 
Neolithic, et cetera, but it's to take in later and maybe you would enjoy, you know, the videos in this collection. That's all. <laughs> oh, indeed. You and Brian Swim have been doing such wonderful work. We look forward to showcasing that when you're ready. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Monica. That, that would be exciting to see. Okay, well, let me move on here. Oops. Okay, I think I'm getting near the end of the material I've prepared. Here. We have lots of questions for you. So, so I, 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 I'm sure Laura is always rich in questions. Yeah, that this is the last one, and it's looking at the sun. And again, this is at Kayamonge, and and I really appreciate you listening to 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 this discussion. I want to state that um, that one of the things that's happened. I mean, COVID has been a very the pandemic has been a very peculiar thing, and. In 19, 2019, I had 22 trips, uh, including two lecture tours in Europe. I was away a lot, but the, all that that slammed shut in the, in the next year, and it's beginning to open up now. And I'm almost resenting it that I'm having to travel. But uh, <laughs> but but part of part of part of what I I really like to do is to, I mean, every morning I get up unless it's raining or which is a beautiful thing it was raining this morning so so that's a happy thing in new mexico now yeah, yeah. Uh, but every morning i i get up and i watch the, the sunrise and my dogs get up and watch it with me and they sometimes wonder what i'm doing but uh but they they do that and when it's clear in the evening i i like to catch the sunset uh and i'll either do videos or the panoramas like we've seen but uh I feel something as, as this is going on. I feel the change. And in a way, um, unlike perhaps I felt in the past, uh, this is sort of a, a, an absolute rendering of time as opposed to what our wristwatches tell us and, and, uh, and, and the pace of life tells us. You know, th this, this pertains to, to the, the big picture of how we are moving, how this uh, planet, uh, it, is is moving around the sun and if diana was here uh, uh my colleague on on the web talk uh she would probably comment that that there are some very special things about this planet we we're looking at many many exoplanets now uh we're not finding any that look like earth so we're, we're in a pretty special place and mm. And uh, it, there, now there may be observational selection effects that, that cause that, but uh, but we're, we're still not finding a lot a lot of Earth. This no. next mission that we're talking about in uh, that will launch in twenty five to thirty years, uh, which is, has an unpronounceable name, which is I R O U V. I can explain why, but you don't want to hear. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it will be it will be renamed, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, uh, is is aiming at at being able to to image and monitor in many ways about 20 exoplanets, maybe maybe right. more around the nearest stars, and that's going to be very informative. At the same time, there are a number of missions, including Webb itself. That will be able to look for biological signatures of life and even the form of life and of course there are vast things being done with the SETI Institute and vast considerations uh, going back to the time of, of Carl Sagan and and you know we have a, a record and a plaque on Voyager in case anybody uh, finds this yeah <laughs> and, and, and uh and Avi Loeb, when he comes back, I'm sure he'll comment more on it. Yeah, uh, uh, Avi's Message coming up in, in a couple models. weeks, uh, three weeks from now or something. But uh, uh, Tony, before you take your slideshow down, and I can see that Woody has a question as well, but before we get to Woody, uh, go back to the very first slide, the banner for today's talk, if you would. Uh, the reason why I mentioned that is because um, a couple of times you quoted me speaking, which I spoke between before we started the, the recording of today's discussion. So I thought I would mention what I, we were talking about. Uh, oh, we yes. have the Queer Manga Institute's uh, labyrinth that you see in the center of this banner. And that was brought up from a question uh, asking us, where is that located? Said, well, I'm very proud to say that that's located at the Institute. 
uh, working with Next Julie, the Julie designed and working with Julie from England, who's in our room today, Julie Strider, uh, who, uh, who I told the story a little bit, and I think we've told the story before in one of our other interviews. But I just wanted to mention that uh, that the, each year we do these summer solstice, this summer solstice celebration, which we're, we are conducting now, we're underway. Uh, Tuesday is going to be the the uh, pinnacle of the whole thing but you can see as the sun rises the stones of the equinox i'm sorry the stones of the labyrinth the entryway yeah the entryway the stones of the entryway align perfectly with the sunrise and so i know julie and i are so proud that that was able to be accomplished and and put together and we get um so many re reports of powerful and wonderful experiences tapping into that energy of of uh, uh, being a part of a labyrinth and then to if the julie's uh, here can she say yes i will have julie, julie we'd just like julie, to honor you for turn this. on your mic for a moment because this is another megalithic marker is it yeah not? and i also yeah. want to mention that um over to the right hand picture is the picture of the gnomon at the institute with the sunrise this was about a week ago but i wanted to capture uh capture the the uh the sun, and so I could send it to Tony, and I said, okay, well, we'll make a banner out of this. <laughs> but this is what we're going to be doing at the Institute. Now, listen, we have uh, been blessed by the uh, blessed by the arrival of the thunder beings, which means that we probably won't see a lot of sun on Tuesday, but we're not going to let that slow us down. We got some wonderful I things. I bet it will be intermittent, if not. Yeah, that, that's the way it always works. Uh, Julie, are you there? Can you turn on your mic, or would you like to share if I can click on her. I'm because gonna... labyrinths too are such a very yeah. old method of yeah. and bringing the heavens reflected. So under. Julie sent us an email about 10 years ago saying, can we have a, a labyrinth at the Institute? I guess her, she's, um, let me see if she's unmuted here. There she is. Hi, Julie. Would you like to speak to this for a moment with us, please? Hi. Um, I don't know. I think you've said it all, really. Um, yeah. It was just wonderful to build yes um yeah I, I before that i had built hundreds of temporary ones that i had to take up um and this is my first permanent, permanent one and i have a permanent one but it's of grass um yes. yeah and that's it's it's harder to keep of grass <laughs> yeah well um, Ju julie and i were like the perfect balance because i'm out there with shovels and and, and uh wheelbarrows and stuff and julie comes with ribbon and she comes out, come she's got this ribbon. long goddess dress on and she's blowing long, in the blowing hair. <laughs> long flowing <laughs> hair in the breeze and uh, so i was like okay bring in the goddess so that and then i'll do the physical stuff <laughs> but but she took on the physical stuff she, she get on the ground and she dug out all the trenches and, foot diameter yeah and and Rather put and put circle. and then we stood each stone one by one and we gave it just that a recognition of having life that it wasn't just a bunch of rocks we acknowledged each stone as it was placed so that became important uh to the ritually whole process ritually yeah, ritually yeah. Uh, initiated each time so anyway mm -hmm. i wanted to come back to that question since tony referenced it and it's something that i spoke about prior to hitting the record button today so had to honor you julie yeah <laughs> so. yeah it was wonderful <laughs> that 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 gathering that we did together on the uh 2014 and we need you to come back now that the pandemic's coming to an end and we'll do more <laughs> and Julie is also a member of our board of directors. So, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah. And a surveyor and, yeah. in Sussex. S yeah. Sussex yeah. Anything else you want to add, Julie? Nope. <laughs> yeah. thank you so thank much you yeah. um, I, I do i do think we have to understand though how important labyrinths are to our world yes um yeah that how connected they are to us and our ancestors so it's really they're really important they are living beings mm. basically yeah yes and so it's an that's it <laughs> no, 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 I can tell we could, we should get you going because you've got a lot to share. Yeah, uh, not now. <laughs> well, another time, we'll just do a labyrinth discussion. That'd be wonderful. Why don't we history of labyrinths? Let's talk about the history can of labyrinths. Can you help on that, Julie? A history yeah. of labyrinths. Yeah. Okay. There's so many patterns. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Love to you, sister. All right, back to Tony. Tony, pull down your slideshow, and let's go to let's go to Woody's question. I want you to have your slideshow pulled down. Okay, here goes. And thank you, you for go. that slideshow. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was nice to all. see it happening at Pueblo Benito and Chaco Canyon. Yeah, uh, Woody takes the question 
uh, in the chat room. He says, how do birds and insects align in flight? This is a good question. How does, what is the, the magnetic People, involved? we have talked to researchers in England who, uh, who have shown photographs of cows lining up mm -hmm. on, in a straight line, and they uh, suggest perhaps it's a lines. Michael or a Mary line, a ley line, an energy line, I see. that they're sensitive to it, yeah. something to do with their horns. Yeah. I'm just saying that's a conjecture. Yeah, I, I don't know. Have you have any comments on Birds, that, Tony? Birds, they're aligning to the... Uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't. I think, I think it's a wonderful question. And it's one of the things I've not looked into, but I, I, I'm all ears if other people do. And uh, maybe if we have people that are more uh, attuned to the biological world, you know, somebody like Vicki Peck would be able to probably inform us totally on it. Yeah. Well, they say that dung beetles push their little ball of dung in a straight line um, aligned with the Milky Way, the arm of the Milky Way. So if they have receptors for starlight, so must and the connection maybe to the so scar scarabs of Egypt, that there was that connection as well, something like that was yeah, potentially. That's a whole other yeah. story. More research. Okay, so let's have some questions and I, comments. I have some while you're getting them okay, ready. Let's go to Laura so, Lee next. <laughs> so, so, Tony, how easy is it to make a flat space? They say on the Great Pyramid, it's very flat. They put a lot of effort into making flat ground. But you said that you didn't have the tools to go to Chaco and actually survey how flat it was. You have said that the eye is very good at noticing what's level. But if you're Absolutely. taking a large space, what are the tools that ancient people might have had to truly level from corner to corner, corner to corner oh. um, well, to make a flat ground? Again, again, I'm going to say the eye is pretty good at recognizing even a minute amount of lack of flatness. The eye is also extremely good at, at noting a deviation of a, of a straight line. And the eye is extremely good at noticing um, uh, details on, on the human face, for example. Um, you know, I've done, I've done some drawing and I've seen how I can horrify people if I have a nose too high or too low just by, a, by the, the smallest amount. It really doesn't look like a person anymore. So we're really well tuned to do these things. Now, I can see where, where the land is not, not flat in front of Pueblo Benito and where it is. And that's one thing, but then to measure it, to be able to say, okay, I have, I have a rise here of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, let's say 20 centimeters, that becomes very, more, more difficult to do. I, I then have to lay out, lay out things or maybe even use a water level or something like that. Like some kind of water. But, we know yeah, that. Yeah. So there are various things that you can do, uh, or I have to set up a theodolite, and and uh, and uh, there are ways to do it. Uh, it it just takes time, and it takes uh, yeah, it takes time. Okay. If is this possible? Would it be possible to set up a global gnomon project, and ask people? who are there at the Taj Mahal, who are there at the various sacred sites, who are there at a, at a site that might be a contender that had maybe used a gnomon on flat ground to align east and west. And wouldn't it be fun? It. Yeah, wouldn't it be fun to go out on the equinox and to go out and start measuring, laying the stones, setting up a gnomon since it's such a simple tool, maybe getting permission from these sacred sites that would have to be coordinated. But I mean, if there was an official gnomon project, wouldn't it be fun to start collecting data on site the world over and coordinating and people reporting back and then putting up the whole, I mean, you could test the theory. Well, well, well I, I, would, I would, yeah, I, I like what you said. And actually the, the, uh, the tilt, I've done the error analysis to see exactly what a tilt would do. Mm -hmm. And it would be really interesting to measure tilts. And if there's an error that's off in- Could be attributed. Say, by by, by 1.2 degrees in the way I predict. And if I found that, that to be true, this would be, be a way to go towards validation that this is the method used. Mm -hmm. uh, right now I'm going by the fact that there really isn't another obvious method that I can find uh, certainly, uh, we did not have GPS uh, a thousand years ago or no. a thousand years ago. We did not have the autolites. We did not have some of the things that we have today. And uh, but this is a, this is a method that would be available, available across all cultures. It just means that somebody or some set of people have made it a point to say it's interesting, the relationship between 
the sun and the sky and, and the earth. And it's the thing that's so fascinating about this topic is that it's not just one particular culture or part of the world. It's worldwide, this phenomenon of alignments. And then the, the human story goes all the way back to the simplest of times. And yet they have these alignments contained within their civilization. They have these kinds of alignments built yeah. into Markers. how they, yes, how, how they function. And that story still to me is, is just, we're at the beginning of something, not at the end. We have, we don't understand, <laughs> but there's something maybe within in the human brain, the magnetic aspect of our brain that we feel that's important to have these alignments too. Not just for, oh. not just measuring, not just measuring okay. for, for plantings and the type of things that people think about, but maybe there's something more to the human physiology that connects to it that feels more peaceful when we align things correctly. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I think I don't, that is so true. I think that is so true. We're gonna we're gonna touch on it with Thomas Wynn at the end of July. Okay, I'm up. For yeah, that. yeah. Well, what, 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 that. Whether, whether that's true or not, but simply the idea that the sun is informing a person sitting on a piece of flat land in Earth mm. where the sun wants to go, and you can see you can see this, you can map this. It's reproducible, and and just this that this information comes from this powerful source in the sky the sun you know it's very interesting and fred mentioned uh, earlier alignments to the east and how important they are in my my work in chaco canyon it's primarily in navajo land but if you look at the uh, the part i'm looking at it's it's very early navajo but you look at the at the remnants of the hogans uh, the doors are aligned to the east however to the navajo the east is where the sun rises so you can actually measure which season the Hogan was built by whether it's tilting uh, more to the north or more to the more to the south. Right. Yeah. So it was built when it aligned when it was built. OK, so it's not just a stick in the ground. I want to acknowledge the sophistication of the cultures who used no bonds in this way. We don't know the whole extent of them, but we know that you had to have something like this in generations simplest. of sun watchers. To well, know whatever. this, do you not? You have to have an understanding that. Go ahead, maybe, Tony. What? What? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it's it, oh. it's such a, it's such a it's such a simple thing to do. It just if it, it could be a dead tree, it could be whatever, but it simply would require somebody to have cognizance and to notice. And I think that's one reason why it can be pan cultural because it is so simple. It is so simple. What's the relation between a gnomon and a sundial? If oh, one is tracking is. the sun's movement hourly or through one day, the gnomon's tracking it through a mm -hmm. calendar year, right? So well, it's the scale. Yeah, and, and there, there are a few other other uh, twists to that. And, and one of my neighbors has built a, a, a large outdoor sundial, and, and it's fascinating. And, and of course, you have to take into account the ellipticity of the Earth's orbit, and, and that's uh, a well-known well -known form. But that that's a degree a degree more sophisticated than than the gnomon and knowing the cardinal directions and and the date. Yeah. But also so, sensing. You mentioned being sensitive to the Earth cycles and right. tremors and movements and whatever. I know the Chinese had set up early earthquake devices where they could even tell in what direction the earthquake came. Yeah. So they would set up four balls. In on cardinal points in a balance, and if the one of them fell because of an earth tremor, they were very sensitively tuned. It indicated the direction of an earthquake. Mm. So, and again, mm. just we're tuned to well, the earth. We're tuned well, to our cycles. We're well, well, to well, earth. well, the the earthquake again is a very powerful thing. Mm. Uh, yeah. I don't know how many of us have experienced earthquakes? Uh, having lived in California for a number of years, I can say I have. And I can remember standing in a parking lot at, at Cypress College in Orange County, and you could literally see waves of, of the, the pavement being lifted and rolling. Mm -hmm. it, had, it had a directionality. It was uh, quite, quite fascinating. Uh, you know, it's also a little bit intimidating, not so much in a parking <laughs> lot, 
you know, I thought my first house was going to shake down in, in 1987, but that's another another story. We, we, we were in Seattle near a pond when an earthquake happened, and it was mm. fascinating, the mandalic pattern, like a cymatic pattern that right. happened I in the pond. That. Sure. And it felt like the wind was blowing through the house, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. was interesting. So, Well, well and, and I, I want to come back to this concept of the sacred, because there's something about the rising of the sun, but the solstice, I mean, like we know about the, the, the thousands of people that try to flock to these sacred sites, each solstice to be a part of something special. They come dressed in garb, they're all prepared, they're bringing everything they can to be a part of it. They bring the drums and, and the sacred objects. And, and there's something about, again, that we're looking for more to, uh, connection, a deeper, richer connection to the planet and to the surrounding universe that we want to be a part of it. So someone like Tony, who's made us life work as being an astronomer, uh, we all want to be astronomers. We just haven't gone through the program. We haven't been trained and educated in today's science. We can we participate, do know, though, but, yeah, on you know, some level. But much like the ancients, it was a sacred practice. Of course, why wouldn't it be? What else would they be there? But to see the stars and the moon and the sun and, and the alignments. Years ago, Tony, two years ago, in fact, when the start of the pandemic, you advised us to set up megalithic markers in our own backyard, even oh, yeah. a wall of the house. Yeah. And I wanna say that that is a beautiful thing to do. That has greatly added mm -hmm. to our lives. You were doing that with the solstice and right. the gnomon, but also, you also said that every day can be significant. Your birthdays, your anniversaries, um, meaningful dates, you can put a little marker and yeah. see and track a year. It's interesting to track time. It's interesting well, well, to develop that personal relationship. It's interesting it to honor the sun. And though the Psalms and the ceremonies, yeah, the sun was going to turn back anyway, but it's nice to entreaty the sun and honor it for giving life. It's nice to entreaty the ancestors. It's nice to understand that we are one moment in a very long chain of events, in a very long lineage, yeah. in a very long rung of of ancestors we're just you know, the latest think, rung and we'll go on i think this is important in, in many ways i know that that um i had discussion with an Navajo woman uh, out in chaco canyon who said oh her mother would be up to cook breakfast every morning and and the light would come through the kitchen window and she'd put a mark on the wall and write the date on it and and so they had this array of marks uh yeah and and, and then they would see it return year after year and and how that was important to them. Now, this is at one level, but I have to say, Paul and Laura take things to it. I put pebbles on the ground. Paul and Laura take things to a <laughs> different level here. I would say okay. he does. Paul, Paul, Paul yeah. could you show a picture of, 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 of the megalithic monument? <laughs> uh, can, at, a, at, at our home? All right. Yeah. As he finds that, then I want to open up the discussion to sure. reclaiming that relationship in so many ways. That's important to reclaim that relationship with the cosmos. Many ways to do it. Well, you find that picture. Right? I can it, add it the is. picture. I'll add the picture in post-production, but it, okay. won't, it would be difficult for me to do it while we're, okay. we're working. Okay. Well, well, I will well, dismiss. Well, think in nine well, foot well, well, columns yeah. of stone. So I, yeah. well, I just will tell the story verbally. The okay. image will be on the uh, video later. So what we did is we, you know, we purchased this home in Sedona, Arizona. It's a dome home, but it's not just a single dome. It's 10 domes in a circle. To, and so everything is in this circular motion. So, uh, but one of my things, of course, we're working with Julie and, and working with the Institute and always feeling this connection to, to these elements of megalithic sites. In fact, we, we're just home with megalithic, megalithic domes. Uh, part of that, that idea was that I would have a stone circle, but the house is pretty tall and big. And I didn't want some little teeny thing, like something, I wanted something real. So I kept doing research to find the right size stones and the right people to do it. And literally brought in nine, 10, 12 foot stones from this quarry that the quarry said no one's ever asked for these before. And so now I call it Dome Hinge. We call it Paul Hinge. <laughs> yeah, I call it Dome Hinge. But Tony, and, and, you were instrumental in saying cite it where you could see sunrise and sunset and have one point. Well, let me so go, let was... me go over the alignment for quickly yeah. so we can go back to the discussion. Okay. But no, so that wasn't possible to do it specifically by the astronomical alignments. So what I discussed with Tony is here's a chance other people might want to do something like this as well. So it's worth me telling the story. I did it in a geometric pattern. I measured it. I wanted to have 10 stones, 10 feet apart, creating a 30 foot circle. 
And so that gave me the geometry to work with. And it was also the mathematics of Stonehenge is, is in the multiples of 10 that I had, had oh. found when I was doing research. So I thought that uh, I can't worry about getting a perfect stone in the alignment with the sunrise or uh, right. on the solstice or whatever, but it's I can create gosh. the geometry. Then I can add the markers later. So I, so I have the geometry of space yeah. and I can add the markers to, to, to follow those events that happen throughout the year. And that worked much better because I didn't, in, at the Institute, I have open sky. Not many of us have an extra 500 acres in our backyard to set up. Um, like the Institute does. Like the Institute has, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So that's, that's the story. And, and, and yeah, I think that kind of answers but that question. It's just if, fun if, to do. If, I, if I, I could add, if I could give one more piece of advice, Thinking Please. of the poor archaeologist, 500 years from now, that's going to to uh, be observing this place, and <laughs> I, I'm sure that they're going to be uh, coming up with theories if Paul doesn't leave a time capsule of of, of the Celtic population in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I think uh, a time capsule, please, a time capsule. Yeah, you know, a, a newspaper, uh, you know, something printed in, in, a, in a sealed jar. Exactly. All right, I have a quick question, then we're going to go open up this discussion yeah, to Bob's many gonna... people okay. on um, on reclaiming this or whatever you want to talk about, reclaiming this this relationship. OK, so I just drew out a little symbol right up here that looks to me to like what Paul and you have traced with your pebbles on the ground at the Nomon, the top one. You've got the winter okay, well, solstice well, curve now. Laura, Laura, we're, having, the... we're having some trouble seeing it. You're you're going to have to oh. get it really close. Oh, okay. Close that only at, so yeah. This top one, you've got the summer right, solstice, right. you've got the yeah. winter solstice, you've got the line down the middle is the equinox. Yeah. That is a symbol I've seen around. And I'm just wondering if that is also an indicator of the Nomon tracings because it's through the gnomon and tracing the pebbles on these uh, four cardinal dates, two equinoxes and one each solstice that you get this interesting. So I'm gonna ask people if you've ever so seen you this that, symbol. The, 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 yeah. I almost think of it like a butterfly effect. It's got the two yeah. wings and the, the body down the center, yeah. Yeah, well, two, two equinoxes. Now this other symbol, I wanna give credit to Ken Zoll, who talked to us about the V bar V heritage site calendar last, um, last summer in the Verde Valley June. of Arizona. Yeah. And he said he felt this symbol, three concentric circles, was the symbol of sun watchers all over the American Southwest and beyond as a petroglyph, because you have the largest circle would be the summer solstice in the, um, the northern hemisphere that has the farthest line from sunrise to sunset, the middle one would be the equinox, and the shorter one would be the winter because it has a shorter arc. And then, of course, you can combine the from the horizon, the bottom of the rung, because that's where the sun goes underground and presumably follows the same path. So he has put out a call, and I would like to echo that, that if you see these petroglyphs, and we've been looking for these and seeing quite a lot of them and, and picking photographs, that he's saying it could be the guild, like the Sun Watchers were a guild. They were a, a society amongst themselves with this knowledge. And they go, would go around building these markers and how quite simple they were because they'd watch a rock, a vertical rock or likely large stone and seeing where it already came and then start putting the petroglyph aligned to it. So watch where the sun wants to hit and then start putting the petroglyphs to it. Then you go to the V bar V of which he did phenomenal work to document this and actually discover it, rediscover it. And then one of the stones famously fell. And so consulting with the Hopi who were the closest ancestors to the Sinigua a couple thousand years ago, thousand years ago, they said, no, no, no. When something falls, it's nature's way. Nature's in control here. This is disassembling its nature. We're not gonna put the stone back. So I ask you, Tony, because I know that you have done surveys around the Southwest, how many were close or how many were partial or how many do you think once were intact, but through time, the stone shift, erosion, they fell apart. There could be many more of these markers around than we 
can officially date because they didn't last to today, but they were once there and functioning as these markers and calendars. What do you think? Well, we, we, a we, conjecture, we, and then I want to go to yeah. questions. Yeah. I'm going to well, start we, with we, French. We, yeah. Bob. We, we, Bob, okay. Yeah, we, we, we do know that, that as, as you mentioned, Laura, that things change. Uh, in terms of, of the three circle model that Ken used, uh, I I don't know if he presented any ethnography. Unfortunately, I missed I missed the discussion of that, so I don't know if he reported any ethnography. But there are a number of, of theories out there about how sun watchers and sun watching would be would be uh, denoted. Some people think by by spirals. Uh, the Prestons uh, at JPL, for example, have have done a lot of research on that. I'm not sure that the results have have panned out as cleanly as, as you would think. And there are some forms like concentric circles or spirals that that people seem to want to want to make just because they kind of represent a sort of infinity type of thing. On the concentric circles, um, I have not gone and and scouted for three concentric circles. I've seen many concentric circles, sometimes as many as 10, 10 or 12 rings in them in, in rock art. So I think this is a conjecture, uh, you know, a call that Ken was putting out rather than, than a statement that this was a-, a It was a conjecture, most definitely. Uh, yeah. No. Oh, and, no, you know, yeah, go ahead. I well, here's another mention... pattern. We see the spirals like at Fajada Butte, the Sun Dagger and elsewhere, and then you see a shadow line or a sun line go across it. I just want to acknowledge John Matthews in his talk. He oh. mentioned a petroglyph in England that looked just like that. Right. Yeah, in his talk. Both of those but, talks are on our website at queermongainstitute.com, and you're welcome to view those. Go to our. Yeah. our uh, it's okay to ask these questions. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. We're not yeah. saying yeah. it is, we're saying it, what is. Let's go to some. It, yeah. So what about Bob? You mentioned Bob. It's so interesting if you're combining the same symbolism taking place by the ancestral Pueblo people. And, yeah. and, and and in early England, it, it's a it, it's quite a leap. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a leap, but but who knows? I mean, uh, uh, if this is how the shadow is showing, and the spiral is is a, a very compelling drawing you in type of figure. Absolutely. And then there are questions about right-handed spirals versus left-handed spirals, and, and <laughs> I, I will say I will say they are they are, spirals are abundant. And, and that's what I was going to say. Spirals and, are abundant. No. And if a shadow line comes over it because the sun casts it, that could be so universal. It yeah. could be universally seen. It's, it's yeah. And spirals yeah. are just there. Well, we have yeah. a couple hands up. We have Bob's got his hand up. Uh, we call him Woody. And then Frederick has his hand up. We call him Fred. Bob, we're going to, or uh, Woody, yeah. <laughs> we'll go well, to you. I, I would ask a question. You know, I, I, I can see why societies would want to know the sun's coming back or there's time to plant a crop or it's time to have a party or it's time to have a lottery uh, to, to 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 select the the virgin that's going to be killed I, I i could see all that 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 that'd be it'd be useful uh for the society to to uh understand the the, the motion and things like that but I don't understand how a connection to a, a spiritual, I, I, I just, so that, the, that's a leap in logic that I just don't understand. How would, how would that logic uh, leap occur? How, what, what would lead one to, to think that, that somehow this is some uh. spiritual God thing? Mm -hmm. Well, I think maybe I could uh, give you my opinion, Woody. It's a, it's a, it's a superb question, and uh, I think there is, first of all, there could be very strong feelings associated with observing phenomena. I mean, to me, it's striking to see that straight line. It's, it's striking to watch the sun advance along the horizon, then stop and reverse itself. Uh, <clears throat> so, so this. Um, evokes a feeling in me. And I think very often things that evoke a feeling uh, have attributions of, of being spiritual. Um, and I don't want to claim that that's false or, or that that's true, but, but it would seem to be a, a very easy thing to do, that, that, that this does have some kind of, of meaning on that level. 
And on the other side, I mentioned the Antop among the Shumash people, where right. they actually felt it was important to ceremonially bring back the sun in winter in Santa Barbara, to bring back the sun, to bring them warmth again, and and to do ceremony. And and uh, and as I say, they were always successful. It always came back. <laughs> I think. Yeah. yeah. I think you're bringing up a really fundamental question, and I think it also ties in to that indigenous worldview of you see culturally where they see even speaking to the stones, speaking to the trees, they have a way of, of reverence and, and of, uh, of seeing the sacred and things that surround them. And so maybe the word spiritual is different than the word sacred, but the, the reality is I think that they just feel a, a reverence and connection and they, therefore they make it something that's special well, about their life. Well, like, maybe sacred would be a better term, yeah. I, yeah. I, I like the word sacred. I like yeah. that too. Looking for something beyond themselves. Okay. Yeah, good, good, good. That's the definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Woody well said. I, I agree. I'm, I'm stuck here, and I can't find food, and I'm, and I'm going to be eaten by the the, uh, the 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 tiger. So, is there any way to protect myself? Uh, yeah. Great. Right. We'll send we'll send you food if you need it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And Thank I you. think this is a great one for Thank Fred you. Smith Thank to you. add to. Well, Fred can add. Yeah, yeah. That, that's he he's a, that's his area of scholarship. So let's add yeah. Fred into the discussion. Fred, let's have you add. He's still muted. Okay, whatever I could add. Um I uh I did have a question, and it's a question that's kind of been gnawing at me for a long time. And I suppose I could have looked it up by now, but I didn't. Um, is there, um, you know, given the, the, the distribution of these uh, spirals and other kinds of, of uh, petroglyphs, um, is there, I mean, do we know anything about the deep history of, um, of the construction of gnomons or these spirals? I mean, my, my sense, just having studied mythology and history, is that, is that there was a diffusion, that this is a diffusionary product, although people in all parts of the world could have discovered this, I suppose, independently. But I think there's something very diffusional going on here. But do, has, have you looked into this, Tony? Whether so culture is sharing, culture is traveling and sharing. Yeah. yeah. Well, well there, there certainly were cultural migrations. Uh, and we know, for example, that there was direct, not indirect, but direct connection between Chaco and, and, and the Mayans and the Aztec people uh, there. Uh, and a number of things did did travel both ways. So yes, there is diffusion, but it's a little harder if you look at something like like building alignment, how this diffusion would have would have happened uh, in Europe, Africa, Asia type of thing. Yeah. That's what, that gets to be a little bit more of a stretch. And so I look more at the simplicity model that that there is something extremely simple about it, that there is something that very compelling about it at the same time. And, and if you had somebody that spent a, a little bit of time, you know, made time to sit there and watch the shadow all day, they would begin to see things. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, go yeah. ahead. Patterns. Yeah, and but it coming back to the mathematics, like Monica's making the question or a comment on the golden ratio in the Fibonacci series. Monica, would you like to jump in on the discussion as well? Um, when we're asking questions about like the meaning and whether it's sacred or spiritual, and and I I think of it as a des a need and a desire in the development of humanity from from you know Neolithic times and the beginning of a reflect of self reflective mind mm -hmm. that that self reflective mind and to begin thinking about thinking starts to to need to deepen into a whole of which we are part. And so that sacredness is present from the very beginning. And we begin to feel the sacred depths of our own self. And, and that fuels the whole scientific development that brings us here to, you know, to have uh, done the amazing work in, in, in astronomy and everything else to have learned about the movement and harmonies and all of this. And, and in that process, you know, of being under, under the moving stars and, um, and the canopy of that and to, to have done the work, the scientific empirical work to, to, 
to gain an understanding of those patterns, we began to recognize the presence of those patterns in everything. So, and we even discover that the universe began um, in, in, in a big, you know, a, call it a big bang or an original flaring forth out of which we came. And it, it, it is true, you know, it is sacred from the beginning. And now we're reflecting back on that. So that's why I bring up like, you know, when we ask about the deep history of this, this deep history is the whole of existence that, you know, and in those original commitments made by the, by the universe to flare, you know, to um, expand at one particular rate, and then everything worked with it. And those are, that's what we see with the Fibonacci series and the golden ratios and and, and this ties into our perception of beauty and our ethics and everything about us. So how can it not be sacred? It's not no, that's just true. a world out there. It's a world in here. That's, oh, that's so beautifully put, Monica. I think that that sense of awe, when we can understand that sense of awe, we're automatically into the sacred realm, right? We're into the spiritual realm, something larger than ourselves. And that it makes sense that it's dependable, that we can form a relationship with it. It makes sense. Somebody's at home. Somebody's governing all this. There's an intelligence to this. There's a coherency to this. Well, I, I think that is such a safe sense. feeling. I mean, this is debatable. This is certainly debatable. Yeah. 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 Let, let, if, if I could, could add in, um, you know, it's one thing to live our lives with all the layers of protection we have around us right now. Uh, but there were many years of my life where I spent a lot of time backpacking in the desert, uh, including the Sahara Desert, but that's a whole other story. And there, the layers of protection go away. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, the intuition, something else starts coming in. You, you're like reading how the land fe feels. Uh, I mean, I, I know when I place my sleeping bag at night, here's a lovely flat place, but a message says, don't sleep there. And I'm, I'm pretty sure if I did, I would probably would have encountered a scorpion or a rattlesnake type of thing. And I'll sleep in some other place and I've never had a problem. But there is something intuitive that comes in um, with when we strip the, these layers away. And I can just imagine the intu intuition that would come to me, you know, if I didn't have GPS and didn't have a computer and, and just what it's like being out in the desert for a while, I would begin to observe things uh, sense things in a way that's almost uh, impossible for us to imagine sitting at home or, <laughs> or, or in the modern world. Uh, and of course, soon we're going to have more satellites and stars. So that's the other, other story. You know, you mentioned when we strip away our technology, our other senses can come forward. I think that technology and its latent huzz, buzz and hum and frequency moving through our physical bodies, it's jamming us. It's jamming those senses to a degree. And yes, I agree with you, Bob, that it's an uncertain universe and there's, there's so many chaos and order, this dance. But we want to seek what's dependable. We want to seek what's coherent. We want yeah. to seek. I, I think I, 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 that is, I think I would debate whether science what came about be, be because we're, we're we're searching for the spiritual. I I, I don't think science came that. I think science uh, um, opposed the restrictions put on by spiritual. And I agree with that. I, I don't disagree with that. that that's, that's true. But we're seeking knowledge. We're seeking, we seek yeah. to know. Yeah, we we'll see. Yeah, yeah. And and I was one, you know, and 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 the Gnostics, uh, you know, that that I can certainly, I can I can get in with with, with Gnostics. Yeah, let's seek knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Good point. Uh, also, I was going to throw, Secrets. since we've turned this into a round table, I'm going to throw Brian Tucker on as well. Hey, Brian, get yes. a comment? I, well, beautiful comments going around the table already. Um, just to build on, I guess, Monica and others, I'm just reminded about the power of symbol on the human psyche. And earlier, you know, um, Tony, I think about your invitation almost two years ago to build a marker on our land and begin to attune our psyches 
to the rhythm in a new way of the cosmos. And at that time, COVID was very much a rage and, and a preoccupation. So what, what happened by turning the psyche, my, in my own experience, turning, turning the psyche towards the cosmos, um, I, I got to live a, a year or two cosmically reaffirming my sense of belonging to a, a rather mysterious and wonderful, despite the kind of horrors that the world is being presented with on so many levels, um, I've been able to put my mind on topics of what a grand design this is that we're all a part of. And Tony, I think about the James Webb Telescope and Monica, your work with Brian Swim and those wonderful uh, videos and Fred, you know, breaking apart of of religion and getting to the deeper layers of meaning for us all. But I think the central question, there was something that Thomas Berry was concerned with that, you know, the era in which we're living, we need to establish a new pattern of rapport with the planet in order to move forward. And that it's going to take something almost like uh, at the level of the artist and the scientist as an artist, the scientist as a poet to help restore this sense of rapport with the natural world. So, you know, tools like um, the gnomon at the Cuyamonga Institute, these are powerful symbols for the world. So many people live, I'm right now in a neighborhood fairly devoid of a night sky because of light pollution, fairly devoid of a sense of nature because of the concrete jungle that cities have become. Um, what helps us all communally come together again and feel that deep sense of belonging? And then finally, I want to mention this. Um, the conversation reminds me of societies that have been traditionally solar based. Um, there are societies that are lunar based. Um, some have a mix of lunar and solar awareness. Uh, in Jewish life, I'm aware at the time of sacredness, the Shabbat, which starts for the Jewish world on Friday night into Saturday evening, there's a delineation. It starts with the marking of the first star in the night sky and it ends at the period of twilight. The transition periods between night and day are seen to be uh, periods of caution and yet opportunity. It welcomes in a sense of the sacred from the world of time that we experience mundane. Uh, it's not to say every moment isn't already sacred, but we live in a way that we typically overlook the sacredness of the present moment. So, so there are cultures that like to mark these passages as well to help reaffirm a sense of deep sense of belonging to this evolving uh, wondrous cosmos. So I'll, oh. I'll, I'll just pass it along there. So oh, beautifully said, Brian. I so appreciate that. <laughs> I also think that as we advanced our knowledge to break out of the natural checks and balances that our environment would provide us in nature, so that we wanna break out of just this, this physicality alone, Mm -hmm. go into these altered states. We want to have that relationship with the cosmos. Our world becomes larger. We want to inhabit a larger space. Right. That is another form of breaking out. That is another form of stretching our minds, our muscles, our hearts, our sense of the sacred, our, our living essence, right? To connect. And why not go to the cosmos our ancient ancestors did in a mythic sense, in a symbolic sense, in a visual sense, in a palpable sense. Right. We yearn for that. We yearn for that. Satisfy those deep, deep needs. We're gonna do it one way or another. I think that's the impetus of Woody to go to the ends of the universe with technology. Right. But we could also do it in spirit. And we live larger, we live more deeply, we live more beautifully, we live more connected. Mm -hmm. That is that is a sense that we must satisfy mm -hmm. in our culture, in our lives. We have to do it our own way. way. And, and different opportunities come at different times. And yeah. you know, right now I'm fortunate enough to live where I have a, a really nice horizon, both to the east and west. Uh, but this all started um, years ago when I was in graduate school. And I was designing and constructing a new observatory uh, space, a new observatory exhibit at the Franklin Institute Science Museum in, in Philadelphia. And uh, I went up to the top of one of the high rise buildings at the University of Pennsylvania and took a picture of the city uh, skyline looking east. And then I had one whole wall being a mural 
with, with showing the sunrise over the different buildings in Philadelphia, uh, seen, seen from West Philadelphia. And, and uh, this was moving to people. And, and it was part of what inspired me to, to start looking around and become, and to, when I moved to California, I took a class from Ed Krupp at UCLA and archaeoastronomy and, and off I was to the races and I had a lot of fun in the Californias and, and, and then later in New Mexico and, and Southwest with this. But, but these things kind of come to you and, but you don't have to be at a, you don't have to be at Stonehenge. You don't have to be uh, yeah. in, in a dark mountain. You could be right in the middle of the city and, and notice the sun and the moon peeking between buildings and, and, and just mm -hmm. notice that and think, right. hey, that's going to happen again sometime. I wonder when. And, <laughs> yeah. and by doing so, you're automatically beginning a relationship and you're entering into a sacred relationship. Well, not only with space, but with time. And I think yeah. that's the time. With time. space and time, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. The cyclical nature of this. Yeah. Friend. I don't know if you all feel this, but I've never felt time passing faster in my life than the last couple of years. <laughs> Who's <laughs> speeding up that clock anyway? Oh Tell me to yeah. slow it down. Yeah. Yeah. Especially um, when I'm trying to pack my suitcase to get to the airport. You know, I have lots of time. I have lots of time. And whoops, I have to leave in five minutes or I'll miss my plane. Yeah. And Fred, you know, it's interesting to me how the Vedas map out this gigantic cosmology, it's, this, this, the, the cosmic time, the grand cycles, the grandest, the largest cycles ever. I mean, that was really breaking out. And that, what, what did that serve that culture? What did it add to that culture that they would take so much time and energy to map this out and consider it a sacred text? Well, what was it was mapped out through a series of, of rituals, actually, and the rituals which were to there to kind of mark, commemorate um, time time units, like the sunrise and the sunset. These were calculated precisely. I mean, they knew uh, by the eighth century BC uh, that there were twenty seven lunar constellations through which the moon passed. Um, monthly and of course you know the, the moon is not regularly regular it goes between 21 degrees and 27 degrees declination and um so this was able to be mapped out very very early now, how they did that uh was through direct observation which is a different kind of direct observation i think than what we're talking about for the for the uh cardinality and the equinoxes um and uh, like about an hour ago i sent this friend of mine at oxford a, who does research on the history of Indian astronomy. I said, how did they do this? I haven't heard from them so far, I keep checking. But um, there is this. Uh, and uh, so the, the sunrise, the sunset, the full moon, new moon, the, the seasonal openings and closes, which was marked by particular dates rather than by you know, particular rainfall or something like that. The so, cycles of Venus. The cycles of Venus, in fact, the the um, um, the creator deity was identified with the year, with the cycle. So the cycle was considered to be like an eternal force. Um, there was no represent. It, it was not like a, these rit rituals did not represent anything. They were the absolute. They were the. They were what they were. The the whole notion of symbolism and well, it wasn't there. But there was this. Representation, the, the whole notion of representation um, grew, I think, a bit later on. But but here we have, you know, the where the cycles absolutely were the realities. The earth, or rather the 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 sunrise, the sunset, the new moon, the full moon, these were these were um, absolute forces. So the calendar, the year was a sacred thing. Let me just mention one thing with reference to what Monica said earlier. And, about the the Neolithic, and that's you can take this back to the Upper Paleolithic easily. Yeah. You don't have to go back to the Neolithic only for this. Um, yeah, and um, there's a lot there. Anyway, yeah, Monica, you um, yeah, and we we you, Laura, you mentioned um, uh, uh, the time and the part of the you know having a relationship as you walk through the city and the sun coming through. Um, so what can be said for sure, though, is that Earth itself has a relationship with the sun. Yeah. And then as 
vitalized substance comes alive into life, that is involved in a deepening relationship with the sun as well. And we uh, it, it, creatures invent chlorophyll and they deepen their relationship with the sun. And uh, it, okay, so then as time goes on and now that you know humans, uh, because of the reflective mind, are now in a developing noosphere, uh, this place where we are knowing, you know, uh, it's, it's thinking substance instead of vitalized substance life. And now we're involved in that ongoing deepening relationship with the sun. And not only the sun, but every other planet, I mean, uh, star and it, galaxies and, Everything that came before, we've deepened our minds and the James Webb Space Telescope is gonna discover even more of this. I mean, what better oh, yeah. example of this, of how we are deepening our knowing ability than to have all converged together and, and sent that space telescope out there in the first place. So we are engaged in this ongoing process of deepening our relationship with the universe. And that is spiritual at its core. That is mm -hmm. sacred at its it's, core. Why'd we ever that is separate? Our evolutionary it's just juice. A, yeah. at work. Why would you ever separate sacred from non sacred? I mean, who says what's sacred? You know, it, the difference between phys, you know, physical and, I mean, there's life, there's thinking, you know, everything is some kind of substance. I mean, there was a time when there was nothing physical in the universe, it was all, you know, it's so reality. Yeah. No. And policies too, you know, and that's a whole other area, but yes. So, so Isaac Newton set out, he was a mystic. He set out to understand God's handiwork by examining the physical laws of nature. Yeah. That was a start of our current science. You can go back to Alexander Marshak did a beautiful job of looking at artifacts of the Paleolithic including the Venus of La Selle, one of the artifacts that we use in our work, decode her in interesting ways. And what does she have? She's holding a horn, mm -hmm, right. right? And it looks like a crescent moon and it has 13 striations. There are 13 lunations, 13 moon cycles in a solar year. And she's got a little bit of a pregnant belly and she's got her hand on her belly. And maybe she's pointing to the nine months, right, of gestation. So there's so much built into it. There's other calendrical stones where it looks like they are looking at crescent moon, they make little marks, full moon, they're filled in half. It looks like a whole lunar chart back to the Paleolithic. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are geared to try to understand our world. We are replete with those cycles. We're so tuned to mother earth, right? We're so yeah. tuned to her cycles. And then we want to better understand them. And so part of our noosphere, as you put it, Monica, is to make those charts, make those maps yeah. extend out. Something that we can pass from generation to generation. Well, we got to thank Bob, Symbols. Bob for getting us going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Bob, you ca encapsulated the perfect question yeah. for this. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, if anybody else wants to join the discussion, of course. Who's you got can. your hand up? We uh, Make yourself known. Turn on your mic. Yeah, Add yeah, to this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... Um, yeah, so read, this, read Bob's latest well, Bob comments. And Bob, and Tony are, Bob and Tony, the two, they're talking to each other. Okay, okay. Uh, share Tony, because uh, uh, Bob, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm just looking at Bob's comment, but it was my understanding that Galileo uh, first observed the moons around Jupiter, and and they're quite apparent with a small telescope, a Galilean telescope, and and this was of course a sin to the because of the, the religious requirement was that the earth was the center of the universe and nothing revolved about anything else. So, yeah. and, the, and the question I'm asking was, did, did uh, anybody be before that? Is there, is there any case, any indication, look, look at these things, that people be, 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 be before that knew about moons around, around other planets? Yeah, to my and knowledge, it, not what he and was ignored by the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, to my knowledge, it took the invention of the telescope to do that, yeah. and and uh, so uh, Galileo may not have been singular, so there might have been somebody contemporary with that. I've, okay. uh, but but as the telescope was being 
designed and developed. Uh, and I don't know, maybe, maybe there was such a thing in China or India. A, a How did they know that Sirius was a doublet? I'm sorry? How did they know that Sirius was a doublet? Uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of questions <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that we can ask. Uh, one, one question that Ed Krupp put to me in, in his introduction to archaeoastronomy at UCLA, taken years ago, he, he said, all around the world, the Pleiades is described as the seven, the seven sisters, the seven whatever. But if you look at the Pleiades, you see either six stars or 11 stars, depending on how good your eyes are. Uh, and, and it's not that there are seven stars that are, that are distinct from the rest. And there, it's an open cluster, of course, there are many more stars. But, uh, but uh, so uh, Ed found this remarkable that it was always called the seven everywhere around the world. Hmm. It's, it's one of the little enigmas. So Woody, yeah. it may be a little bit like that. I don't know how Sirius, Sirius A and B would be known. Uh, I don't think we can resolve them. We have what, one minute uh, resolving power with our eyes. Um, and I, I forget how close Sir, Sirius A and B are, but. But, uh, but we don't get much better than one arc minute with our eyes. Weston Price has a book that he cites the ability of humans to see more clearly, um, where he cites a real, probably from the Paleolithic, looks like the Pleiades, same pattern, but there's an A star. And well, he surmises that's... that people could see that back. back well, in well, the let, day. Me, well, let me say, uh, when, when I was a little younger, I could look up. And I could see eleven or even thirteen stars in this. It's not impossible to get to get beyond that. Yeah, mm. well, uh, at all. And and young eyes and dark skies can do that. Um, that, but uh, I, the interesting thing is, you have we have a magnitude scale of brightness, and yeah. if you look at what people are supposed to see with average good eyes, you're supposed to, you would expect to see six stars. Or right. if you have, and that's what Fred is saying. The Pleiades yeah. were considered in India six only. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the, so anyway, Ed Ed Crop had found this remarkable that this uh, was true pretty much all over, except that the there was the legend of the seven. Fred, was there a, a legend in India of the seven? Oh, there was lots of legends on the seven, but as far as the Pleiades go, they were it was very early regarded as six. Yeah. And there's a lot of mythology around that, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even even in Africa, the Dogon and others would, would talk about the seven. But but so anyway, Fred knows about what was happening in India. So um, I really appreciate this conversation, and I would like to go to each of you and anybody who wants to chime in here. Please open up your mic and do so. But what would you? What what is your best way to reclaim this relationship personally? You to the cosmos? What, what activities, what, what do you do to help gain that sense that since I live in the larger sphere, I live in the cosmos, I have a relationship to it. And I'll start with you, Fred, and work my way around the circle. Well, I mean, my orientation is from what I've been studying and looking at in India for the last 45 years, 40, I don't know what, how many years, 50 years. And, uh, um, and I, certainly would advocate a ritual means of doing it, but ritual is not something empty, but it's, it's a matter of, 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 of linking oneself up. I mean, there's, there's a, a ritual is, is actually the establishment of connection. That's, that's what it is first and foremost. And, um, you know, um, um, being, you can, or you, being, you can say, is, is precisely something which, which you see, which you connect up with. Non-being, non, you know, it's something which is devoid of connection. So, um, you know, if we don't recognize something, there's no connection. But if we do recognize something, then it's a connection that we want to kind of um, establish in a more embodied way. And that historically it was a ritual and sort of that's the kind of and they believe there was an energetic transfer transmission energetic transfer. perception yeah. between an element of nature uh, a celestial force that yes, we can really right. activate that in some deep energetic ways to yes, our benefit is energetics after all yeah 
And, um, you know, once we recognize something, then there's an energetic transmission going on. And um, like Tony recognizes, like goes out and does the, the sunrise every morning. I mean, that's an energetic transmission between Tony and the, and the, and the sun <laughs> every morning. Every daytime day. astronomy, daytime ritual. And Lori uh, Snyder says, we need the dark skies again. It's our human right to see the night stars and learn our original, our, our origin stories uh, worldwide. And, you know, you, we can take a trip to some of those sites that still have preserved the darkest skies. Go to Bryce Canyon, go sleep in a tent, go wake up at 3 a.m. We did, uh, actually it was car camping. And you, I mean, it's bedazzling. I mean, it's earth shaking. Go, go to some of the star parties. We've been to Table Mountains in Washington state numerous times. Climb up one of those ladders, go peer through those giant telescopes that are, will surround you at these star parties. Look through those and appreciate the incandescent light of the rings of Saturn. Look at the Hubble Space Telescope and thank Woody um, right here for that. Thank Tony and Woody for the um, James Webb and the data it's going to bring. Go look at the night sky. Sleep under the stars. So, yeah, thank you. Let me just mention one other thing here, and that's that I was reading. Uh, I just downloaded like a half an hour before our meeting this book that's been written about everywhere now by a guy named Ed Yong, Y O N G. On called the immense universe, the immense something or other, and it was, he had a 15-minute interview with him on NPR this morning, and uh, some extracts elsewhere, Washington Post, and so on. And it reminded me a little bit. I think it might have been Monica who posted earlier this morning about the murmuration of starlings. Was that you, Monica? So just the power of non-human being to recognize, to perceive stuff. Like, like Ed Yong was saying on NPR that birds like this guy on my shoulder here can perceive thousands of colors that we can't. And um, uh, I mean- Talk about deepening a relationship with the sun. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. But there's the just- The superpowers that animals have. Oh around us. I mean, we think they're superpowers, and maybe they are for us, but for them, it's like normal. Um, but we're just really beginning to come in, in, in active awareness with, with what other beings can do. And, you know, we want to attribute things to like aliens and so on, but let's look around us at, at you know, the life, life forms we have right here. And their extra bandwidth, yeah. Monica, thank you, Fred, on that. Yeah. Hey, I, I was just thinking I'm the perfect one to follow from what you just said, if, if I was going to go next, but I thought we we're going around the circle. Because um, what you're talking about is, is um, um, you know, just this deep appreciation for this animal on your shoulder. And animal. Uh, hey, he's not having an animal. He's a human. <laughs> <laughs> or you know we're animals, <laughs> you know, to, or I were humans. But but um, in in when I reflect upon how I I want to live or how I'm able to live into this cosmology, you know, in my experience of day to day living, is to see into my own self, my and not only other humans, my children. Um, my relate all of my relationships, my relationship with my dog, my animals, the, a deepening of relationship, connection, and and seeing the presence in everything of the genetical history uh, of becoming that goes all the way back to origin and is ongoing in this moment, so that everything that is present has in it all those commitments made along the way and holds within it the intuitions that Tony talks about that you find in the, you know, this is in the memory of our bodies, you know, so any ritual, any relationship that can get me connection, ritual connection, relationship that can get me into that sense of feeling the presence of that his deep history and anything gets me there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Brian, and then we'll go to Tony. And then we'll care. Well, yeah. what's already been spoken, um, you know, Monica, you just spoke about embeddedness, relationships, seeing the relatedness and everything present. Um, but I also want to mention cultivating interiority. 
the fact that you know we talk about embodied spiritual practice in this community that meditation and ecstatic trans postures they give us access to this liminal realm of consciousness in ways that our culture hasn't yet learned to fully value and honor so i just want to put a plug that you know it's it's how do we develop that intimacy with life um that cultivation of interiority through embodied spiritual practices the embeddedness that monica spoke of the context that others have mentioned here what we learn from the james webb telescope sleeping under the stars being out in nature we understand we live in this vast context um, and it moves us to take some kind of action once we care for a thing in the world we're moved to then want to see that it remains beautiful and then finally i think we we recognize we're on this continuum from childhood from birth into adulthood until elderhood we've been on this journey in life um that might be said of not only our own selves but all of creation is on a continuum and how interesting it is to learn about the elderhood or the childhood of the universe we seem to still be in a childhood aspect of the universe becoming adolescent uh, and why would that be why would we have been born with that kind of at that kind of time uh, we live in a continuum as well well said Brian. yeah thank you okay well we're going tony to... uh you have to summarize you're our guest yeah. i want to thank you but i do want thank to thank frederick uh, I, don't, I don't know if i can improve on, on this and, and what are you saying some great things and lori and uh, others others here. Uh, I, I like the way the word continuum was used in connections uh, as Brian spoke. And, you know, one of the things, you know, I am a scientist. I, I, on one side, if I talk to scientists about science, I have, it has to be evidence-based. But I also uh, have noticed many things and, and the intuitive seems to be really interesting. The, what I call coincidence, some people prefer to call it serendipity, I choose not to for, for reasons that I may want to do research on this. But, but remarkable things happen uh, beyond any reasonable probability. I mean, uh, and if they happen once, I would be say, okay, it, it just happened. But when they happen dozens of times with great regularity, uh, then, then you begin to wonder, like, like what is this? Uh, uh, I may have told the story before, I'll tell it briefly. When I was in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania, I heard a concert. Uh, it was called Songs from the Hill. And at that point, I'd hardly ever been out west. I think I'd been to the National Observatory a couple of times in Tucson. Uh, but I, I liked the concert, I bought the record, I uh, kept the, the program, the ticket, and I even took down a poster. And well, guess what? Um, uh, I was talking to a musician friend recently about the, this music, took out the record, he opened it up, pulled all this information out, and on line one of the description, it said, Songs from the Hill was written in the summers of 70, 75 and 76 in Placitas, New Mexico. Well, yes. this is where it gets even weirder. I know where she was sitting, and the hill she was looking at is where my house is. Yes. <laughs> so, so this sort of thing happens, and uh, and and magical oh, universe. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's like, and I I could go on for another hour or two with really impressive stories, but but this, at least impressive to me. But uh, but uh, this there is something else going on, and even the 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 nature of scientific discovery and. And perhaps in scholarship like Fred and the rest of you do, uh, and certainly Woody and design, where uh, it's not that things come to us out of a manual. They come to us. We, we, we have a feeling for what the answer is. Then we sit down and we prove it. We, we, fill, we fill it in. We find the facts. We, we do the analysis and stuff. It, it seems to be more and more that way than the other way around, that, that, that we pound through a thousand experiments, then we find the answer. No, we care about something, we pay attention to it, and, uh, and an answer comes and then we substantiate it. Uh, that seems to be the true way of science to me, the true way of, of scholarship. And uh, I, if anybody else wants to comment about if they find it that way or not, I'd love to hear what you have to say, but 
It'll have to be for another discussion, and we'll certainly talk about coincidences uh, and all of that in future. But I, I, I just love it when I feel the winds of the universe blow through my hair, and I feel connected, and I feel I am breathing that rarefied air. And we can set ourselves there. Yeah. We can open that doorway yeah. there. And I, uh, wonder, that... yeah. I wonder if I can say one thing. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, it, it and it comes from, from observations. For years, I've been putting peanuts out of my sidewalk, and the crows will put one in their throat and two in their beak and fly away with two or three of them. They've been teaching the squirrels to to line the to to line the 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 peanuts up and carry away two at a time. The squirrels are learning from the crows. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. We were just talking with Fred about yeah. how parrots and crows, ravens are the most intelligent birds in the bird mm -hmm. kingdom. And uh, we talked with a biologist about Heinrich, this oh, German. Oh, Bernard. Bernard, Bernard, yeah. How Bernard, yeah. wolves teach, wolves and ravens collaborate in a forest to hunt. The birds will alert the, the wolves where the prey is. When the wolves take it down, the ravens come in and clean up the job. Yeah. Yeah. So, sure. oh my gosh, that's a beautiful story <laughs> Thank you, that Bob. you observed. Thank yeah. you, Bob. Thank you uh, all for all your wonderful yeah. uh, research comments, stories, sharing. Um, appreciate that. We, Can we just all celebrate together this, one of these um, moments in our celestial clock? We need to embrace- Meant for celebration. We, we need to embrace the knowledge that science has to offer today. And we still want to live the magic. Live oh, the magic. I said you. So, I mean, yeah. that's- Thank you. That's at the foundation of our, at least our journey, and I yeah. hope all of you as well. So I want to say blessings to you, Tony, Tony, mystic and scientist. Well, well, Tony Hall. Thank you all. I, I, I really appreciate you listening and uh, and the insights that, that so many of you have brought. And I'd love to hear more from you about these things. Uh, I know that that it mean it means something to me to observe the patterns of the sky, at, and it's so easy to look at what the sun does in the morning. And in the evening, and uh, and it has a whole different. I have a whole different sense of time. Believe it or not, now that I've been sitting here for the most part for the last couple of years, yeah, <laughs> it was a benefit to that pandemic, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah, it made yeah, there, there is the bright side of everything. Yeah, you know, uh, some people say that they're um, uh, breatharians. They're going to close their eyes to the sun and take in the nutrients. Yeah. I think that we don't need to go to that extreme. We can have that relationship with the sun. We can activate that energetic mm -hmm. relationship, the stars, the moon, the whole the whole cosmos, and yeah. imbibe and imbibe so much of that energy, joy, love. And finally, Life Tony, was. you have to go because he's Tony has offered to prepare the meal oh, for the yes. Institute. He's cooking for 20 people. So <laughs> <laughs> after doing this lecture, so. he'll be presiding oh, over the Nomon. Yeah. yeah the the I didn't know. No, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> It'll work he's out. He's also a gourmet cook, this man. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. Penalty he's a catch. Best. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you all. This is part of our part of our everybody and, and a, a pleasure to be on with you. Thank, thank you.